Please stand for the call to worship. And with the call, this time is marked out as belonging to our God and King, and it is our privilege to hear his voice and to respond with thankful hearts. Shout joyfully to Yahweh all the earth and serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing, knowing that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, giving thanks to him and blessing his name. Because the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness extends to all generations. And so together, let us respond to our God for his grace to us. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in covenant love to all who call upon you. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Called by our God, we come before him, and he greets us with these words of blessing. Grace, mercy, peace, and comfort says your God, the Lord, the King, who is the first and the last, and his Son, our Redeemer, Jesus the Christ, who has been bestowed the name that is above every name, and the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead and who now dwells in you. Amen. Let us now confess to the world and testify once again before God that we do believe the God who has revealed himself in Scripture, and this is our only confidence in life and in death. Let us profess together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We will sing Psalm 23, affirming that we do believe God cares for us and loves us, but in particular, we are also declaring we believe the promise. We will not only enter the house of God, but we will get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that emphasis will be necessary as we consider the promises of God this day. So Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, found on page 10. shepherd I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green he leadeth me, the quiet waters by. My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth Please be seated. We affirm we belong to God. He leads us. He shepherds us. He cares for us. And so let us value what that means and let us turn to him and learn from him. Beloved, 
in the day you were delivered from the domain of darkness to everlasting life, there was great joy in the presence of God and his angels. And you have been called now to glorify God in all of life, knowing and doing his will. And you will know his will from his perfect and most precious law. Hear then the law of God. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in the heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing covenant faithfulness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Let us better understand what this commandment means. Brothers and sisters, what does God require in the second commandment? That we in no way make any image of God, nor worship him in any other way than he has commanded us in his word. May we not make any image of all. God may not and cannot be imaged in any way. As for creatures, though they may indeed be imaged, yet God forbids the making or keeping of any likeness of them, either to worship them or to serve God by them. But may not pictures be tolerated in churches as books for the people? No, for we should not be wiser than God, who will not have his people taught by dumb idols, but by the lively preaching of his word. A few things to consider here. Number one, the commandment prohibits making idols or images to worship or serve God by them. And it says, if you do these things, you hate me. Now, many people would say, no, I just, you know, I just find it, it helps my devotional life. But the contrast is in the commandment itself. If you love me, you do not make images or idols, rather you hear what my prophets, what my apostles tell you about me and you respond accordingly. If you decide to come to simplify religion, in other words, instead of hearing God, understanding God, doing his will, instead you have a picture, you can throw some sacrifices towards it, some offerings and move on. God says, you hate me, I will not respond to you positively. You will be judged, and not just you, but your children after you. On the other hand, what a blessing he promises. If you love me, if you actually will hear my words, understand the covenant I have made, and what I will do for you, ultimately sending you my son, I will bless you for a thousand generations. So let's not look at this commandment in a servile way, kind of like, oh, let's just do what God wants. Understand God is promising amazing blessing for generations to come if we love him, if we hear his word. And that's what question and answer 98 is about. It's very easy to kind of reduce our religion to external acts that are really easy to fulfill and you can seem pious in the sight of the world. But we ignore the living preaching that explains and preaches to our hearts what God wants. And that's what's really needed because God is the personal God. He wants you to know him, to respond to him rightly, and he will bless you. He will open up the overflowing fountain of blessings for us. Our problem now is, of course, we are natural idolaters, so we must confess our sins. You are a royal priesthood and a holy nation called to declare the excellencies of God's grace. So what have you done and who deceived you to do these things? Why have you fallen from your high station? God made you in his image, upright and holy, but you have sinned against him and his law. Though he did not spare his own son, you still did not believe that he would graciously give you all good things. But now is the day of repentance. The Lord rebukes and reprimands you because he loves you. And if you hear him now and repent, he is faithful and just and will forgive you your sins. So let us as humbled sinners call out to our God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So you've heard this law and you have asked God to reveal to you the grievous ways that are in your heart. So does this law absolve you or condemn you? It condemns me because I have sinned and am without excuse. If you cannot fulfill the requirements of God, where is your hope to be found? 
God the Father predestined me. Jesus paid for my sins with his own blood, and the Holy Spirit regenerates me. In sum, now I am justified by grace alone, through faith alone. So how will you now live before God? I recognize my high calling, signed and sealed in my baptism, and will walk in newness of life, a slave to righteousness, under the sanctifying work of the Spirit, thankful to God for his blessings. It is right and good for us to acknowledge our sinful condition. It is also right and good for us to confess we believe the promise of God. He will give to us a Savior, and the Savior's work will save us. Let's confess our sins, let us put our hope in Christ alone, and let us receive that blessing. Our great and holy God, by your Spirit, lead us in the way of truth and righteousness that we would understand who you are and that we would believe your word and worship you rightly as you have commanded and not stoop to man-made religion as a means of getting close to you. And help us to realize it is right and good for you to be jealous for your holy name as it is the name that is above every name and the name by which we receive life from the dead. So we pray that you would continue to transform us, to sanctify us, not only to forgive us our sins, but really to make us grow as new creations, bearing the image of Christ our Lord. May we love you and be thankful and worship you rightly. And Lord, may you receive our worship because it is mediated by Christ the Son. We thank you, O Lord, that you remain merciful and gracious far beyond the gods we have made up in our hearts. We pray that you will train us up in the way of truth and righteousness, and indeed, you will make us fit to dwell in your house forevermore. May this be our desire, and may we be thankful that you promise to work this in us. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus, your Son, our Lord and King. Amen. We've heard the bad news. Let's hear the good news. Please stand for the declaration of pardon. Beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, to you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' merit alone, I declare in the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, your sins are forgiven, and the record of your transgressions is blotted away, and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ Jesus, who will resurrect you in the last day. Let us respond by affirming what is the righteousness that God requires and know that it is in Christ Jesus, the man who walked the way of truth and righteousness, that we will be blessed. Let us therefore seek the wisdom and counsel that the Lord gives and forsake the foolishness of this world. Psalm 1, that man is blessed, page 11. That man is blessed to fearing God from sin restrains his feet, who will not stand with wicked men who shuns the scorner's sea. Yea, blessed is he who makes God's love his portion and be Please be seated. 
As we turn now to the pastoral prayer, we go before our God and we lift up to him many different prayers, petitions, and concerns. Obviously, we cannot cover every single point. However, you can see there on page 16, uh, we pray for local matters in our own church. Uh, we remind ourselves to pray for our own nation and the, uh, those in positions of authority. And we're also praying by calendar date, as you can see, uh, throughout the nations of the world that God would bring uh, peace and, of course, the gospel. Today we'll also add in particular the nation of Armenia and the region of Karabakh, which is at war at this time, and we'll pray for peace and for comfort there as well. Let's pray. Our great and holy God, we come before you and we marvel why we're even here. How is it that we who have followed the counsel and the ways of the wicked have been given the privilege of being in the presence of the holy, perfect God how did we who loved sin come to dwell in your house? Lord, we are thankful that you are far greater than we could have ever imagined. Not only holy and perfect, but gracious and merciful. And you have been able to reconcile these things, your holiness and your mercy through the cross of Jesus Christ. We come before you now, therefore, humbled and thankful that we have been given grace that we recognize we deserve no good thing, and yet we are heirs of all the promises, and we will dwell with you forever. Help us, therefore, to set aside the things of this world, to more and more think the thoughts of Christ, and to delight in the work your Spirit does in us, that we are being transformed, that we are being made to be prepared to dwell in, with you forevermore. Let us, therefore, learn to love and to love and to delight in doing good works and to do so with hearts filled with gratitude and thankfulness. Help us to be thankful that this is our church, that these people are the body of Christ, that they are our sisters and brothers. Help us to recognize that it is a privilege to lovingly serve, to do good, to forgive and to set aside any hurt and any anger that we have and instead to know we are being trained up by you in this time. Let us also be very humbled by the knowledge we are the cause of great grief for others. We have spoken poorly. We have failed to do what we ought to do. We have harmed others, and yet they have been gracious and merciful. They have forgiven us. Let us therefore be thankful that you allow us to live together as one, but help us to realize the calling that we have, that we are to show our love for you. and. We are to be a witness to the world of the power of the Spirit of Christ in us by our love for one another. Teach us, therefore, to walk in the way of truth and to love one another and to do good in order that we would be a lampstand and bring the light of the gospel to a world that is perishing. We ask now that we would remember those who are missing. We know some are absent because they are concerned, they are fearful for their health, and Lord, we pray that you will Give to them whatever they need. Prevent them from depression. Strengthen their faith and restore them when things are all well. But we also know there are others who are absenting themselves because they have grown tired of hearing the gospel. They see no need for these things. The sun rises every day whether they pray or not, and they fail to realize you are the eternal God who is patient, but they have taken your patience to be licensed. Forgive us that we act this way also, and we are aware of that, but we pray that you will not allow our brothers and sisters, our wives and our husbands, our children, our parents, to die in their sin by failing to care for the things which really matter. And so we ask, by your Spirit, work in their hearts and restore them to yourself, restore them to your church, and may we again hear the voices of our sisters and brothers singing your praises and expressing gratitude to you for the mercy that you continue to extend. We pray for the witness of the church, for our federation, for all faithful confessional Presbyterian and Reformed churches to persevere in truth as the gospel is not popular, never has been, but it is the only hope of man. And if we should be hated and despised, it's because we are your disciples. Let us therefore receive these blows and these insults with joy in our hearts, knowing that our reward is in heaven and your elect will be blessed as the gospel is going forth in the world. And so we pray for the missions and ministries, the church planting work that is taking place throughout the world. And we pray especially for the nations this day that you have called to our attention. Lord, we pray for those lands that have a Christian witness but is corrupted. 
We pray for Samoa, San Marino, San Tome, and Principe in Serbia. Lord, we ask that in these lands where the Bible is present in the language of the people, you will cause the people to study, to read the word, that by your spirit you will give to them life. And these churches that are now moribund and ha that have denied the truth will believe the truth, that the truth will be preached, the gospel will go forth. Many will believe and be saved and that these lands will be restored. Lord, we also pray for those lands where the church is in trouble, where they are in minority, and yet you have loved the peoples of this land enough to give to them the light of your word. We pray for Senegal and for Sierra Leone, and we ask that the church would grow from strength to strength in righteousness and in truth, and would be a witness to the Muslims around them, and to animists, and to pagans, and to atheists, and that those who are now in darkness will find the hope of life. And in your church, you will give to your precious body, to your bride, a people who love you and love one another. We also pray for Saudi Arabia, which is one of the worst places for believers, where there's severe persecution, where Muslim Arabs who convert are murdered. Lord, may the church in this place be purified. And may the church once again bring the gospel and the hope of life to the Arabian Peninsula. And where in that land there is now all kinds of lies and deceit, may the truth of the gospel burst forth and break the chains of sin and oppression of this land. Lord God, may you be glorified and may you be praised by the children of Ishmael. And we pray also for the land of Armenia and for Karabakh and the war that is taking place. And Lord, we know that there are many elements to this, ethnic but especially religious, where there is a despising of the Muslims of the Christians. And we pray for the Christians to do what is necessary, but to do so with the hope of bringing the gospel and the word of life to their very enemies, to pray for those who persecute them, believing that you are more powerful than all the wickedness of this present evil age. And so we ask that our hearts will be comforted in the knowledge that you rule over all, Learn, teach us to trust in you and to believe that you will heal all wounds in the right time, that you are a good and loving God. There are many needs in our congregation. There are people who are becoming more depressed at the isolation. There is sin in families. There are sins by which we are affected. Lord God, we pray that you will grant to us confidence. You will make all things right, that you can heal all wounds, that you can reconcile enemies and make us brothers and sisters in the Lord. May your name be glorified as you minister your grace to us. And now we pray that we would come before you confident of this. We are no longer aliens and strangers. We will not die alone and isolated in a far off land, but we belong to Jesus Christ. And therefore you, O oh God, are our Father. And we pray as your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, let us please stand now for the reading of the written word of the Lord. Turning to the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 3, 22 through 24. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Exodus 33, 1 through 3. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, 
I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you will stand in, on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of armies. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of Yahweh. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of armies, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Salah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of armies, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Salah. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be thrown at the threshold in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Turning then to the New Testament, John 14, verses 1 through 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father." Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So far the written word. Our God, we come before you humbled by the difficulty of the passage we have just read. And we pray for your spirit to lead us in wisdom and guide us into the way of truth and help us to understand what we must know and how we are to live so that we will truly know you, believe in you, love you, and do the works to which we have been ordained. May you be glorified, O God. May you receive all the praise as you do the work you've promised of redemption of sinners in this world. Amen. Please be seated. The Apostle John, led by the Holy Spirit of God, wrote to us the Gospel testifying to the ministry, the work of Jesus Christ, and what it means for you and me. Why we should know these things. Well, the reason is very simple. God is. We are his creatures. We live in his world, but we have sinned against him. And therefore, there is the threat of judgment hanging over the heads of every man, woman, and child in all creation. And yet, the eternal God, before he began the world, 
willed that he would save and have for himself a glorious kingdom, a people whom he had redeemed. And this is a remarkable thing, considering that God willed that of a people who blaspheme his name, he would choose for himself those whom he would make precious, whom he would purchase with his own blood. And that was the only way for us to have the hope of life. And so that is what John is recording for us. That is not what the world wants to hear. The world is quite content in the way we do things. And as long as the sun comes up tomorrow, we're pretty sure we're still doing okay. I mean, we might have been able to do a little better, but clearly we've passed whatever mark. We have gone over whatever bar was set. But then Jesus comes and he shows there is clearly something amiss in the world. And there is clearly many things these people who have studied the word do not understand. We obviously have the story of Nicodemus where Jesus says, look, you're a teacher of the law, but you have no clue what you've been talking about and you've not understood anything that I have said. Do you not know that you must believe in me to even see the kingdom of heaven? And unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so there is this confusion, but it's not just Nicodemus, it's also his own disciples. He keeps teaching them, he keeps explaining to them what must be, and yet they are confused and they do not understand. And particularly, they really don't grasp what it means that for there to be the hope of life, the eternal God had to be humiliated and had to die that cruel, disgusting death on the cross. And they're not getting it. They are convinced they have in their presence a miracle worker. They have with them someone with power enough that they are going to be able to unify, put together some kind of an army, fight the Romans, throw out the Romans, reestablish a kingdom, and bring about the promises that God made. And therefore, Israel will be the dominant power, the house of David will be raised up again, and there will be peace in the land. And Jesus says, you're pretty much wrong on everything except that I will bring peace to the land. But it's not going to be the way you want. It's not going to be the way you expect. The miracles that I have done were not to show you, oh, you know, here's a taste of what more I am going to do once I become king. You know, I gave bread to 5,000, but after this, no more need to farm. Every day, I will provide bread for everybody. Everybody will eat. Right now we wait for rain, but you know, I gave enough water to drink and I'll be the rivers of the fountain of life. And therefore we're not gonna be dependent on the weather. We're gonna have overabundance, which means our armies can be fed and we can conquer. No, that's not what I came to do. Rather, all of these things testify to the depth and meaning of my ministry. I will give to you what you need for spiritual life. I will be food for your souls, and you must believe in me. These things will nourish your faith. The people, of course, are not satisfied, which is why we read of Judas plotting to betray Jesus Christ. Well, what happens then? The rest of them are confused, but they're also sure of one thing. Even if there should be someone in their group, in their little circle, that fails to honor God and do what's right, they still will do what's right. They will hear God speak. They will read and study the law. They will offer the proper sacrifices. They will give the correct temple tithes. And they will enter and dwell in the house of God forever. And then Jesus shows the humiliation that he must undergo. He does the work of the lowest of slaves and he washes their filthy feet. And then he doesn't do this as kind of the final sign. Rather, it's, in a way, it's his entrance into a much lower status because he's gonna go from a slave to being the animal sacrificed, the one who is the sin bearer, who is cast out. He is too disgusting to remain in the land He'll be taken by the hand of a faithful man and deposited in the wilderness never to return because he has the filth and the sins of the people on him. Well, this is not what they signed up for. It's not what the people understand. And they are confused. On the one hand, Jesus is saying, I'm God, 
but I'm going to be doing the lowest and filthiest of work and I'm going to have to die as cursed by God. I will do no more miracles. I will not be with you anymore. I will not feed you. I will not give you new wine. I will not give you water or bread or heal your sick or raise your dead. Worse than that, you hotshots who think that you are so faithful and zealous, Peter, you're going to betray me three times under the brutal persecutions of a young girl. So Judas, the treasurer, I mean, always treasures are someone that you trust to some degree. Judas is going to betray. Peter, in many ways recognized as being the leader of the band, is going to deny Jesus three times, and all the rest of them are going to flee. And Jesus is going to go away. And in that time, Jesus says, I don't want your hearts to be troubled at all. Don't worry. What do you mean, don't worry? What good news have you given us? You who are supposed to be our king is lower than a slave washing our feet. Our treasurer is about to betray you and destroy the unity of this group. Peter, who has always been zealous for you, is going to deny you three times before dawn today. And the rest of us aren't going to stick around and be with you when you're arrested. Really, don't be troubled. Don't worry. What do you mean? What he means is this. Believe that this is the greatest day because this is the day in which I will be glorified because my glory is not about how much light shines, how much gold I make, but how much love I have for you. And therefore, this is the day in which you should rejoice because now, finally, the way back to the tree of life will be opened. You will know you have been in the presence of God and you know the mind of God. You understand what all the types and the shadows of Israel pointed to because you will see it fulfilled before your eyes in me. And because of me, you will not only have access to the tree, but to the very house of God where you will dwell forever. So don't let your hearts be troubled, even though this is the body of Christ. Don't let your hearts be troubled, even though there's people in this congregation you're afraid to look at because you've offended them. You've said something bad to them. You have failed them. Or you're angry at them because they have failed you. No, don't let your hearts be troubled. Rejoice that this is the body of Christ because if he can save people like that, he's saving you also. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe that I am the one sent to deliver you from death to life. I am going to go to prepare a place for you. All right, that part seems pretty simple. But what does that mean? Where is he going to go? Now, when he says, I'm going somewhere to my father's house, what would be the first thing they would think of? In Matthew, we've seen it, that zeal for his father's house has consumed him, which is why he cleansed the temple. So if he's going to his father's house, what, he's going to go a few steps away to the temple in Jerusalem? What's he going to prepare there for us? Lord, we're not really sure where you're going. Well, let me explain, he says. I'm going somewhere to prepare a place where you can dwell forever. Why can't we go with you then? Because you've told us earlier that where I'm going, you cannot come. Instead, you have to stay here and just love one another. Yeah, because that's the way. I'm the way, and I'm going to give you my spirit, and you're going to now be able to love as I have loved you. And because of this love, you are going to do greater works. You're going to do it with absolute confidence because having seen me, you will also know the Father and I will be in you. So a whole lot of images are going on, a whole lot of things, and there's some confusion. So let's look at what's going on here. Number one, this is an acknowledgement by Jesus that his disciples are not dwelling in the house of God. In fact, that at that moment, he is not in the house of God, that there is somewhere else we need to look to go to. Where is that place? It's the place that we've been thrown out of the place where God dwells, where there is the hope of life and where every good thing is present. And that is where God temples, where God tabernacles. 
but man was cursed, thrown out, and the cherubim guarded the way to the tree of life along with a flaming sword. The way back to where God dwells is through the guards, through the sword. It is by way of death. And Jesus says, I'll open up that way. Exodus 33, God has told Israel, the people who have the law, you're disgusting. I've told you what pleases me. And I've based that on my miraculously delivering you. You grew up with the stories of your father Abraham being told he would inherit the land of Canaan. Now, in your lifetimes, in fact, a few weeks ago, you saw me powerfully work against Pharaoh, all his priests, all the Egyptians, and I brought you out by my miraculous power. And then I revealed to you what pleases me. And it didn't even take you a month and a half. You've already made a golden calf, an idol to worship me. I will not be in your presence anymore because I'll destroy you if I am. And so he tells Moses, I'm not going to break my word. Go to the land of Canaan, but I'm not going to go with you. Moses, as a type of Christ, says, no deal. You go with us or kill us here, but we don't go without you. So God honors the plea of Moses because he gave Moses his spirit to plead this thing. So Moses then presses his luck and he says, let me see your glory. And God says, that's not going to happen. You will experience my mercy. You will have my presence. Your enemies will be destroyed, but you will not see my glory because if you do, you would die. Lastly, we have Psalm 84. The psalmist is feeling a longing in his heart. He is not at the house of the Lord. Now, this is part of book three, so this could be a psalm from the exile, or it could just be from earlier at a time in which David is not at the temple. But either way, the psalmist recognizes something isn't right. Yes, I know I won't see the glory of God. Yes, I'm not going to enter back to where the tree of life is in its fullness, but at least at the temple, at the house of God, I know God is still working out my salvation. Because when I go to the house of the Lord, it reorients my thinking. Because in the world, I look around me, the wicked prosper, the righteous suffer. Horrible people die comfortably in their beds. Righteous people are murdered for praising the Lord Jesus Christ. But when I go to the temple, I see the sacrifices. I understand the consequence of sin, and I recognize I deserve what's happening to those animals, but they are a substitute, and they are pointing forward to my redemption. So I would love right now, even in bloodied, dying, just to be able to touch the doorway to the temple. That's what I believe is the imagery there that you see in verse 10. Not that I would be a doorkeeper, the guard, but rather I would be the one who has crawled there, bloodied and dying. But at least before I died, I got to touch the doorway of the house of God. I could see the sacrifices and I could know there's hope for me. And because of that, you see in verse 6 of Psalm 84, even though I'm in the valley of tears, these tears will become the rivers of life. It will be converted because God will be doing these things. Well, that's the imagery now. All three of these images are being referred to in John 14. The disciples want to see God, and Jesus says, you do. But you see God veiled, his glory hidden, so that I don't destroy you. But you get all the benefits of God's presence, and more than anyone else ever received. Because when Moses and the Israelites had God's angel present, he was veiled. Remember, he was the pillar of cloud and fire, and he conquered the enemies but he did not give to them everlasting life. But now God veils himself further. He's no longer a towering pillar. He's the lowest slave washing your filthy feet, but he's with you. And when you see what he does, he goes to the cross and dies the death you should have died. Then he grants you access, not just to the earthly temple, but to what it pointed to, to the heavenly temple, to Eden, ultimately to heaven itself. And so the way is opened, 
access to the temple is granted, God is present with us, and what's the result for these disciples? Well, there's good news, obviously, but also terror. You have to leave us, we're going to be alone, no more miracles. But then you get really, I think, the most overwhelming thing. And I'm leaving you in the world to do even greater works than what I just did with you. What does that mean? Well, to many people, it means, well, if Jesus healed one sick person, we're going to get to heal a thousand. If Jesus raised one dead, we're going to raise entire cemeteries of people. If Jesus fed 5,000, you know, we'll feed half a million. None of those are correct. I mean, it's great when we're able to help uh, with hospitals and feeding and things like that. But that's not what he's talking about. The great work that he is doing is saving sinners. The great work he is doing is taking people who deserve to die a cursed death, where God should actually turn away instead of destroying them by being there, and God is going to give the word of life. And for three years, Jesus ministered at best. He had maybe five, six hundred disciples when he died because he reveals himself only to a few hundred after the resurrection. And yet, just a few days after he ascends to heaven, Peter preaches one sermon. 3,000 are baptized that day. This little band of Jewish men and women in an obscure province of the Roman Empire are now the foundations of a worldwide religion. And you, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, are worshiping and praising God with thankful hearts because you have, in the cross of Christ, seen the glory of God. In the humiliation of the righteous one, you see the mercy and love of God displayed in the most powerful way. And you are now part of that work that these men began after Christ's resurrection and ascension. This, you, are the result of the greater work. And this greater work is continuing even now. We don't sit around and mope that we don't get to see miracles. We are thankful that we are past the age of miracles. We rejoice that we're not still waiting for the hope of being able to bring the gospel to the nations because the work has been done. The most difficult work was Christ dying. And now he's given us the spirit that raised him from the dead to preach the gospel and bring the dead to life and to give life to the nations. Are you feeling depressed? Yeah, because you see this is our church. We're not impressive, not by the standards of man. But you look and you realize, wait a minute, the church has never been different. There's never been a church of people more magnificent than us. Because our glory is not who we are physically, but whom we are in Jesus Christ. Therefore, every true church has always been the body of Christ. Every church has always been the beautiful bride of Christ. And that's who we are. And we are given the privilege of doing this work. And he promises us we will do greater work when we rest it, when it's built on the foundation of his work. So what does Jesus want his disciples to know on the night in which he has announced, I'm going to be betrayed, you're going to run away from me, Peter's going to deny me three times before this night is out. What does Jesus want his disciples to do? Rejoice. If he says, don't be troubled, then he's commanding the opposite. Rejoice. Be confident. Know that God is your God. You believe in God. Now believe in me because you've seen the works I have done by the power of God. And because those works testified that I have come from God, every word I told you is the mind of God revealed. And what was that word? You will be given the Spirit. You will be born from above. You will enter the kingdom of heaven. You will become the temple of the living God. So Psalm 84 is being fulfilled at this moment with you and me being gathered here because we are part of that living temple of God. You don't have to cling to the very threshold. You're part of the building. You don't have to fear that you're going to become an outcast because God is going to preserve and uphold you. And in fact, at the end of the book of John, 
we see Peter's restoration. Now, I don't know about you, but betrayal hurts. Having people fail you, it's difficult to trust them again. Jesus listened to Peter call curses on his head. And just to clarify what that means, that's the polite English he called curses on his head. The more correct thing is he was telling this girl who says, oh, no, no, you're friends with this Jesus guy, saying, God, damn me if I'm friends with him. He said that three times. Jesus heard him. Would you be friends with that person anymore? Would you tell that person just a few days later, you know what? You, cur you ask God to send you to hell rather than admit that you've known me? Go your way. Jesus comes to Peter and he says, I told you I picked you. Go feed my sheep. I am entrusting you and your fellow disciples with the entire work, the entire value of my death. Go and freely give it. And then he gives Peter his spirit on the day of Pentecost so that Peter would be able to do it. And Peter would joyfully go out knowing he was a walking dead man. He was going to die for the gospel and it was a joy because he was going to dwell in the house of God forever. So, let not your hearts be troubled. There is a glorious opening for us. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. We will have access to the tree of life. We have seen and will see more fully in the age to come the unveiled glory of God seeing not only his mercy, but his amazing majesty, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, exactly as we testified singing Psalm 23. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Ask me anything in my name, according to my will. It'll be done. Pray for the people you love. Pray that the kingdom of God would expand as they are brought in. Pray that those who have fallen away will be restored. Pray that even the excommunicated would have repentance in their heart. Ask in Christ's name. Why wouldn't he restore those who have received the sign of baptism, who've been marked out as his own? Believe he will do these things and rejoice. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Go forward, but do it in the right way. Remember the second commandment, not from the hopes we have and the idols we create, but according to the revealed mind and will of God, and that is Jesus Christ, who will be the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you because we are troubled, because we have ignored your commands. We ignore your commands because we love to sin and we worship idols. And you know we will fall away, we will betray you, we will call curses on our heads rather than be ashamed when people mock you and we are identified with you. And you go to the cross loving us. You died the brutal death in order to pay for the very sins we are committing while you die your brutal death. You command us now, don't be sad, don't be depressed, believe in me and by believing, have life in my name. O oh God, work in us what you have promised to do, that we would find in Jesus Christ the way back to the tree of life and to God himself. Grant that we would know that this and this alone is truth and life, and may we receive it by your grace, because you are not like us, but you are merciful and gracious, and you fulfill your promise, and you make for yourself a beautiful bride this day. We ask all this in the name of Christ, whom we despised, but who loved us. We thank you for this mercy. Amen. And so let us sing and testify that we do believe it is a wonderful thing to be not only promised, but to know we will enter the house of God. So we'll sing Psalm 84. You see the six stanzas there on pages eight and nine. Let us stand and sing.
You may be seated. The Lord our God has granted that we should continue on in this present life, though we are already citizens of the eternal kingdom. But as citizens of the eternal kingdom, we get the privileges. We do get the food of that kingdom, which gives to us spiritual nourishment. And so the Lord's table is not a token of remembrance. It serves that secondarily. But it is first and foremost a testimony from God to you. You are my children. You need this nourishment. I give you Christ himself in order that you will know you are not alone, you are not forsaken, but the work that I've given you to do, you do by Christ's spirit who is in you. As surely as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are assured by me, I am really and truly with you. We turned into the formulary in order that we would understand more fully and appreciate more deeply Christ's wonderful work for us in the supper. We believe and confess that our Savior Jesus Christ did ordain and institute the sacrament of the Holy Supper to nourish and support those whom he has already regenerated and incorporated into his family, which is his church. Those who are regenerated have a twofold life, the one physical, the one we all have from birth, and the one spiritual, which we have by the preaching of the gospel. This is unique to the members of the church, and so while God grants to all men bread for ordinary life, he gives to us the spiritual bread, the body of Christ, for our spiritual life. Second paragraph, in order that he might represent to us this spiritual and heavenly bread, Christ has instituted what we would understand earthly and visible bread to be a sacramental sign of his body and wine as a sacrament of his blood, testifying by them to us that as certainly as we receive and hold the sacrament in our hands and eat and drink the same with our mouths, by which our life is afterwards nourished, we also do as certainly receive by faith the hand and mouth of the soul, the true body and blood of Christ, our only Savior, in our souls for the support of the spiritual life. Now we know Jesus is not wasting our time. This sacrament really does do the very thing it promises, but it is not understood or appreciated by us, but yet we believe it is, in fact, what God promises. And we know that his work is majestic and it is incomprehensible to mere creatures. So we receive it by faith. This is a spiritual feast at a spiritual table, and we receive the spiritual blessing of Christ himself. And so we are nourished, strengthened, and comforted by eating of his flesh and quickened and refreshed by the drinking of his blood. And though the sacraments are connected with Christ, who is the thing signified, not everybody who partakes will receive both. The ungodly and the hypocrites will eat and drink this sacrament to their condemnation. They do not receive the truth of it. Even as Judas and Simon the sorcerer did receive the physical elements of the sacrament, but not Christ who is signified by it. But by a true and living faith, believers do receive Christ himself and are made partakers of his death and life. Lastly, we receive this holy sacrament assembled as the people of God, humbly and reverently, keeping up among us a holy remembrance of the death of Christ our Savior. And with thanksgiving in our hearts, we make confession of our faith and of the Christian religion. Therefore, no one ought to come to the table without having previously rightly examined himself, lest by eating of this bread and drinking of this cup, he eat and drink judgment to himself. In a word, we are moved by the use of this holy sacrament to a passionate, fervent love of God and our neighbor. And so we reject the idolatries of man, all the mixtures that are damnable inventions that have been added to the sacrament, and we receive it in the simple way Christ and his apostles have given it to us. Now unto him who loves us, 
who has released us from our sins by his sacrificial death and has now raised us up with him to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and evermore. Amen. Let's pray. Our God, grant that you should receive the glory and the praise of a people who are nourished, who are given this spiritual food and drink. May we come before you knowing that you really are with us. Your word is sure and true. And we thank you for this visual testimony, for the visible sacrament of your word, that we would be assured you really and truly are with us by your spirit and you will never leave us or forsake us. Strengthen our faith and give to us the courage that we should go forth and boldly proclaim your grace to the world. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. And so, beloved, lift up your spirits and hearts on high. Again, at this time, we invite those who are more concerned about safety issues, please come forward and receive the sacraments before others do, and then the elders will dismiss everyone else starting from the back. We ask that you come from the center aisle and go up from the side aisles back to your seats. Please come forward to receive. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. But he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. So whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Come to me. All of you who are weary, overwhelmed, heavy laden, I will give to you the true promised Sabbath rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come and find rest for your souls, for I am gentle and humble in heart. The Spirit of the Lord God has anointed me to bring good news to you who are the afflicted. He sent me to bind you up who are brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, freedom to prisoners, and the favorable year of the Lord where all your debt is canceled. Also to announce the day of vengeance against the enemies of God so that you who now mourn will be comforted. The Lord will grant to you that you will have a spirit and a mantle of righteousness that the world will know you are the planting of the Lord, that he would receive the glory. The Lord of hosts will prepare for you a lavish banquet, and not for you alone, but for all the peoples, bringing them to this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, refined aged wine, and on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from every face and remove the shame, the reproach of his people from the earth. The Lord has spoken. On that day, we will declare, behold, this is our God for whom we waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and we may walk in his paths, and he will judge between the nations, and nations will no longer lift up sword against a nation, and neither will they study war anymore. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Worthy are you, Take the seal, the scroll break its seals, and to execute the will of God. The disciples of Jesus needed encouragement. They also needed to be able to understand and believe the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ assured them by his spirit he would never leave them or forsake them. On that last night that he would spend with them on earth, he took the bread and broke it and declared to them, This is my
my body. It is going to be broken for you. Do this and remember me. Beloved, take, eat, remember, and believe the body of Christ broken for you. Jesus also took the cup and declared, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Beloved, take, drink, remember, and believe the blood of Christ which washes away your sins and makes you fit to dwell in the house of God forever. Let's pray. Our great God, we are humbled by the thought that we are descended from the man and the woman who would listen to the serpent instead of you and who would try to steal your glory away and dethrone you. We are troubled that we are of the same race of people who would betray you, deny you, curse you, and crucify you. Help us to understand how great is your love. We thank you for this testimony of your covenant faithfulness to us, how you continue to uphold us even though we had to confess we sinned against you yet again. And yet you have not broken your covenant. You have not denied yourself. You have never failed to fulfill your promise. And now you testify, just as surely as we receive the bread and the wine, you still remain our loving Father, and we are still united to Christ and receive all his benefits. With this testimony in our hearts, strengthen us to go forth from this place without shame in your name, without fear of persecution, to boldly proclaim the excellencies of your grace and to be a light to the nations. And we pray, make this work effective. We ask it in your name, for your glory, for the sake of your bride and her beauty. Sanctify us in truth. Lead us in the way of righteousness and many, many more be called in and become members of your church. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. With the offering, we have the opportunity to demonstrate our thankfulness to our God. And so the offering is part of the worship service so that we are able not only to lift up our voices, but to also give a tangible expression of our desire to help the gospel ministry, the preaching of the word, the planting of churches, sending missionaries, and of course, taking care of the material needs of our sisters and brothers, those who are without food or clothing, that they would be provided for. You'll have an opportunity if you wish or if you are able to give your offerings as you exit. Now, beloved, let us stand and call upon the Lord that he would bring all the nations before him to praise his holy name. Psalm 117, you see printed there on page 7. Praise Jehovah, all ye nations, all ye people, praise proclaim. For his grace and loving kindness, oh, sing praises to his name. For the greatness of his mercy, constant praise to him accord ever. The Lord said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Well, now he goes on to explain what he does want. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound, overflow in hope. And may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you and me to live in such harmony with one another, this in accord with the teaching and will and power of Jesus Christ, that together we may all gather together and glorify God and Father of our Jesus Christ with one voice professing the excellencies of his grace. Beloved of God, go in peace. Amen.